So, power to the music. Yeah. Um, you brought some fun slides along, and I just thought it would be cool if we just took a look at them really quickly. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we wanted to talk about decentralization. And um, if you think about that, it, um, decentralization in the music kind of started back in the 60s when studios looked like this. And actually, the invention of, of the MOOC synthesizer, like, like a modular synthesizer like the one uh, just behind you there, um, was actually the first wave of decentralization uh, in music. Because before that invention, um, it was really expensive to create a piece of music and to record that in a studio. And, and with uh, one of these synthesizers, with that invention, at first people used that synthesizer to add some effects here and there uh, to a production, but then they found out that they could actually make music with that machine. And that greatly reduced the cost of uh, recording music, and that opened up a whole market for independent labels and independent artists. So if we weren't going to talk about decentralization, I thought, you know, uh, late 60s and, and the invention of the MOOC synthesizer is, uh, is probably one of the starting points, yeah. What you're saying is back in the day, we mm. used to have a band full of people in a recording studio, each making sounds. Yeah. But then with the advent of the synthesizer, all of those sounds and also yeah. drum machines. Exactly, because it was so expensive, only major companies could afford to record a decent album. So, and if you fast forward to where we are now, right here, is... What program is that? That's Ableton, I think, right? Ableton, yeah. yeah. the is, favorite. <laughs> <laughs> is that, in principle, any kid of 12 with a, with a $100 laptop can create a professional sounding recording or potentially even uh, a worldwide hit. So you can see the when it, complete centralization from, from major companies owning uh, production studios to where we are now, where everybody can basically make music. But being, you started at Spinning in 2008. Mm -hmm. So you've seen the industry go through tremendous amounts of changes. Um, how did this not bring down the record label industry? What did uh, Spinning and Records has, has this amazing ability to adapt and survive and become, you know, quite famous uh, through social channels? What are some of the, how did you guys do that? Well, I think, you know, Spinning has been around since 1999. So it has seen all these technological changes and they always tend to come in waves, you know. Um, so it has seen the change from CD and vinyl to MP3, then from MP3 to, uh, to streaming. Basically what happened was that uh, we went from an ownership to an access market, you know. Back in the day you went to a record store, you picked out the records that were offered at that moment and uh, you added it to your collection. With MP3s you also uh, put it in your own collection, but you could choose out of every music in the world. And with streaming, you, all, you, you instantly had access to all the music in the world. So you, so you can think of how, how that uh, uh, put our industry upside down every time. You were asking how we adapted to that, right? Yeah, well, you guys <laughs> just did a tremendous job staying on top. You have 17 million subscribers on YouTube. Mm. Um, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of changes. Some, some fell and some rose to the top mm -hmm. and spin and rose to the top. So how did you guys do that? How did you get 17 million subscribers on YouTube? <laughs> well, that's not an easy question to, uh, to answer. <laughs> but, because we um, all want to know the <laughs> secret, right? <laughs> no, I think back in 2008, we, uh, we knew because the industry went from this, from this ownership to this access market, um, that we knew that the audience was was be will become lost at some point because now you have this these personal Spotify playlists which work super well. But you mean there was information overload that could have been... Yes, uh, because back, back in the day you had your iTunes library and then all of a sudden overnight you got access to all the music there was basically. So we knew people were going to be lost. And um, so what we did, we, we focused more on the curation part with our brand and we put the, 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 the S more in the middle and, and try to be the light and the dark for everybody who was lost in this, in this wave of music that, that came over. And that also enabled us for our artists and our music to get to rise, let them rise up uh, above that wave. You know, we want to be the, 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 the Batman sign for electronic music online, like, like over there a little bit, you know. <laughs> so, so basically using the power of when there's a sea of information, which we all experience every day, mm -hmm. being a leader through curation. Yes, that's, that's the opportunity we saw 
And we knew we had to put our brand, because it's a really recognizable brand, in the middle of that. So people would instantly know that, OK, if I see this S, this will be OK. This will be good. So that's on the strategy part. Uh, how Do we, we have it? an S? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there, there, so there, you guys there. were great at branding as well. Yes. So we, we, we branded it heavily. And uh, second of all, so that's more on a strategic way. And more, uh, you know, music as well, because you want to know how you make 17 million subscribers. Right, yeah. uh, music works really well on social media because uh, a cat meme that works well as well. But you know, a cat meme is just like you, you see it, look at it, and you, you laugh, and then you share it, and then it's gone. But music is more part. You know, people are more emotionally attached. To, to music. I mean, young people even make it part of their, their identity. So that works really well, and we knew that on social media. People want to talk about it, people um, want to share it, etc. And And that combined with, uh, I, in my opinion, one of the best A&R teams in the world who picked just the right tracks and the right artist enabled us to yeah, create a, a substantial amount of audience around that S. It, really it was a bold curator. move to take music and put full tracks out on YouTube instead of putting them on records and putting them in stores. Yeah, so because also it's not only strategy and only music, it's also sometimes a little bit of luck. I mean, <laughs> if you, um, uh, one of the stories I always tell is the, um, how we started our YouTube channel. So that was back in 2007, 2008, and we knew it was a great opportunity and we knew we had to do this and we knew the, we had to do it, we had to do it well. But we, we uploaded um, the videos and the audio of that releases to YouTube also because our radio promoter, he needed an easy listening link to send through email to the radio DJs. So it started out as like a convenience for your radio promoter also. to listen to the tracks and then it turned in. <laughs> yeah, it sparked our attention because not only was it a good solution, but also we all these views, they came pouring in like thousands and millions of views. And that's when we realized, oh my God, this is super powerful. We need to go all in on this platform. So so it's it's a little bit of strategy. It's It's a lot of music and then also a little bit of Serendipity. A little sprinkling of yeah. luck. Yeah. Which, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but since then, beyond, uh, beyond even your YouTube subscribers, mm. Spinning Records has done a tremendous amount of using new technologies, new platforms, and gaining followers, not just on YouTube, but in, in many other ways. You've had some inventive ways to um, get new talent. Um, what are some of your other innovative ways that you've used uh, social channels and the audience um, uh, to to build spinning. Yeah, that's always tricky because you know new uh, new platforms and new solutions and new applications they come and go, and you really have to find the right time to get into it. You know, you don't want to be too early because I don't know who remembers Meerkat like two years ago. Everybody was completely crazy about that, and a year later it was gone. But you don't want to be too late because otherwise you'll miss out on the um, on the first mover advantage. So we try to see what's happening, keep your finger on the pulse in the market, and then at the right time, use something, and once you have the feeling it really works, um, then, then go all in it. A good example is what we have here is um, Lively. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Have you guys heard here. of Lively out there? Show of hands. It's one of the new music platforms. Yeah. Tell us um, what you do with that. That's well, really cool. Uh, Lively is basically a streaming app, just like uh, Periscope and Meerkat was. Um, and the good thing is it, it, it works really well. It has a really young target audience. And we once used it um, at a live show, a live spinning sessions event in China. And I don't know anybody who has experience in live streaming for China knows that it's sometimes a little bit troublesome because of the whole internet connection. And, but because Lively and Musical.ly, which is its mother company, um, is originally from Shanghai, one of the reasons probably is it works really well from China. So we were streaming that, and we got the support from Lively. And all these European and US kids were looking at it. They were like 10, 12, 13 years old. And they were seeing live how the Chinese dance market was exploding at that moment. So and that, those are the moments you really think, OK, we need to push really, really hard on this platform and then, and then make it successful. So that's the way how we cope with, with new technological platforms and initiatives, et cetera. Did you purposely set out to reach uh, 10, 11, 12, 13-year-olds with, with the label, or did it just kind of happen through that platform? Yeah, I think that's, that's the demographic of the platform, yeah. 
What, will you tell us what's happening in the slide? What, what is actually, uh, oh, is who's, who's talking and, and uh, what's going on with those emojis that are flying everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> this is Quintino and Nervo, and so we do a live session, did a live session uh, last week, I think. And um, they were explaining and talking to the kids about their new releases and, 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 and pre premiering them for them and letting them hear it. And the kids are just throwing emoticons at them and, uh, and commenting. And it eventually was, I think, 21,000 uh, kids watching it live. So that's good. That's incredible. Yeah. That's great. Also, you have some, I think what's really exceptional about Spinning is the talent pool program that you have. <coughs> Because the perception is that only superstars magically become the next big promoter or DJ. But Spinning Records has a really cool way so that everyone can submit a demo. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, which is also pretty original? Yeah, I think um, so. That was uh, five years ago. We, we had a problem because uh, we got, I think, over 100 demos a day sent to demos at spinningrecords.nl. And the people who sent their demos to, to that address, they got an auto reply, kind of saying, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, and that was a problem because it was, uh, we could miss out on the next, you know, big star. But it was, it was also not very uh, cool to all those people who put yeah, all their. crushing dreams. You send in your exactly. demo, you never hear anything and it's, back. <laughs> and it's not that we didn't want to listen, but it was just too much and we couldn't listen to it. So we, we thought, okay, we need to find a solution to it. And then we came up with the idea to, to build a, an application. First it was in Facebook, now it's on our own platform where people can just ingest their demos and then uh, ask for their social environment, so to say. So their friends and their family to vote for their it. Their network, yeah. Exactly, and then they, they can just upvote themselves on the stack of demos. And for us, that's really convenient because we can listen to the tracks and now we listen to them daily and we leave comments, we leave feedback, and if we like it, we sign them. So that's, that's, that's something, you know, from a, uh, how we use technology to solve this problem. Yeah. Great, it's very innovative. Yeah. So you guys are on the pulse of, of sort of new platforms and what's happening. So mm. I'm gonna ask you a difficult question. Mm. What do you think is next in the world of labels and music and electronic music? Where, where are we going next? Well, I think if, if you listen to, to, um, to Hartwell's talk, you can know, you know what's, what's becoming uh, uh, the next big thing, like VR, etc. But the most interesting thing, for me at least, is AI. And not so much AI on what you, what you see right now, like AI on marketing or advertising. That's super cool because you now you can finally do something with all that data that you gathered over the past few years. But I think the most interesting thing is AI on a, a music production, like music creation. Because um, I think, and anybody who is into this subject a little bit, I think everybody agrees that within 10 years, you won't be able to hear the difference between a track that's made by a robot, basically, and a human being. So I, th I don't think you will hear the difference anymore. And Wait, so let's ask the audience real quick. Let's see what they say. Mm. All right, guys, if you th do you think, who thinks that you'll be able to tell the difference between a robot and a human producing your track? Raise your hands if you think that you will be able to tell the difference. Really? OK. Not a lot of people. OK, and then raise your hand if you think you will not be able to tell the, the difference between a robot and a human producing the music that you hear. OK, so you, uh, the, the crowd's oh, with you. Hey, hey, time the will tell. With you, my time, yeah. Yeah, time will tell, but I don't think that's mainly, I don't think that's the point if you can't, or can't hear it, but it, it, it forces you to question what your role as a record label is, you know? Right. You get big questions like, who owns music that's being made by, by a machine, like it totally made by a machine? And, you know, a, a thing that also uh, puts my mind in motion is, is, is the talent pool. We hear that the tracks in there are getting better and better and better every year and every month, and of course, people are getting better at producing music. You know, you can compare it with, uh, with sports, for instance. T tennis players, when you look at a tennis match from the 70s and you compare it from now, you can see the, 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 the difference in quality. So people are getting better at producing music, but then I'm thinking maybe software is getting better in producing music as well. So, and, and that's, I don't know where, where that will end. You know, will we ever go to an event to see someone or something maybe? perform and create music on the fly for maybe an audience like this, you know, it's completely specified 
or, or, or on their moods or, or what they want at that specific moment. Those, the, I think those new developments are more interesting because it will disrupt everything. Yeah, so. well, you've been around <laughs> for a few different disruptions, and yeah. I'm sure you'll be around and yeah, spinning records exciting. will be around for the yeah, next. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any um, advice for anyone else who's not in the music industry when their, when what, you know, when their industry gets disrupted? Any any uh, advice for how mm. to stay on top? Well, I think it's it that's. It's difficult to give advice, especially to a lot of smart people here, you know, <laughs> without kicking in open doors, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but from my experience, I think the why question, the all over why question is still the most unanswered question in technology and innovation. You mean, you mean if you're going to invent technology, no why or? No, I, what I mean by that is that what I've seen over the past uh, 10 years, almost 10 years, is that I've seen so many people hopping into new technology, just you know, adopting it to, for the sake of adoption, you right. know? And uh, I've seen people spending, I don't know how much money on an iPhone app because you needed to have an iPhone app. I, you need an iPhone app without thinking, okay, why do I need an iPhone app? Why would people even do something with my iPhone app? And then later on it was, we need to have a platform. And then now it's like, oh, and then it was, yeah, you have to collect data. You have to collect data. And I can almost, I can almost see them at the coffee machine, you know, three guys. And the one guy says, yeah, we need to collect data. And the other one says, uh, yeah, do you collect data? Yeah, I'm collecting data. And the third guy, you know, he thinks, oh, shit, I'm not collecting data. What am I doing? And then he goes to an IT company, and then he's going to build this thing to collect data without ever thinking, what am I going to do with this? What you am know? I going to and do that's with what I, And that's what, is, what, what keeps coming back. So my advice is always to, to think about why you are doing it. And why would your, your audience or your, or your customers even want this? Why, why would they use it? Because if you think of it, if, I don't know, if, is there any developers in, in, the, in here? Yeah, because developers, they ask that question all the time because, you know, that's part of how you develop or maybe you use Scrum or whatever technique. And, and on that level, everybody knows why, why you're solving a certain problem. But on, on a high level, sometimes it just doesn't seem to be there. So that's, that's, I find that fascinating and, and a reoccurring thing over the past 10 years. So that would be my advice. That's Always great. So do, you know, let's all ask why, <laughs> and uh, then we'll stay on top like they do at Spinning <laughs> Records. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you. Thanks for sharing Thank you. your Thanks for coming. great ideas with us. Oh,